Folks, thank you for coming to our session today, how to revolutionize your workplace with conversational AI assistance. To set the scene, I want you to think that it's a beautiful day out. Sun is shining, birds are singing. It's the perfect day to go for a run. Put on your best running shoes, you stretch a little bit, and you head on down the road. And as you get about 1,000 yards into your pace, you just start feeling good, well, there's a detour. Go a little bit further, there's another detour. You carry on and you continue. The weather begins to change, starts to rain, and begins to distract you a bit. You carry on, then your shoes start to fill up with water. And what should have been a leisurely jog, what should have been a great run, well, now it turns into a fight. And by the time you get home, exhausted, you say to yourself, well, was any of that worth it? Folks, my name is Rob Ryan. I'm the head of thought leadership and product marketing at WorkGrid Software. And I'm sure that analogy was not lost on you, that that is our workday. That is the modern workday that we live within. But today, what I'd like to do is really unpack how conversational AI is not necessarily a futuristic concept, but a way for us to take that broken road, that broken path, and turn it into a smooth one. Um, what I'd like to do as well is really discuss digital friction as a whole. We'll talk a bit around where it comes from, how it arises, and of course, the downstream effect on employees. And look, there's a lot of great conversations around AI, the use of AI happening um, in each session. What I'd like to do is actually bring this down into very concrete, practical uses in the way our customers are using conversational AI within their business. And the last bit, I'll talk a bit around how to measure for friction and what to look for in a conversational AI assistant. But before any of that, we have to talk a bit around the elephant in the room or the elephant in the workplace. Gartner has a decent definition of digital friction as the unnecessary effort an employee has to exert to use data or technology for work that gets in the way of focusing on the right tasks and actions, making the right decisions. It's a good definition. When you hear digital friction, what I want you to think about is waste. It's waste of time, waste of effort, waste of your cognition. And it comes from a number of areas. The first is app sprawl, app overload. I have too many places to go to perform activities and resources within my digital workplace. It's information overload. Once I get there, there's too much information in which to filter, find, search through, and hunt. It's also all the distractions, the disruptions, the pings, dings, the attention black holes coming from those same applications and information vying for our attention, bringing us back. And make no mistake about it, AI friction will be on the rise. As apps begin to layer in AI within their services to promote their value prop, that's going to add into a layer of complexity and friction that we've yet to see. Okay, so let's talk a bit around digital friction kind of the day, and I'm sure this will look familiar. What is it? If you think about how your day unfolds you're ping-ponging. You're going from your internet to your CRM to your DRM to your HCM. Let's not forget about email. Are we using Teams? Are we using Slack? Who's doing what for where? Is any of this rationalized? This data, I'm sure you've seen time and time again. 54% of employees spend their day wasted searching, validating, formatting information and data. It's a waste of 32 plus uh, days per year and Pegasystems, I believe it was right back in 2018, provided some great data in terms of the number of applications knowledge workers were using, somewhere around 15 to 18. That skyrocketed to over 30 in your average organization, over 10,000 folks. And in fact, there's some great research from Gloria Mark uh, from UC Irvine, who has measured workplace productivity and context switching that has shown that your average knowledge worker will actually context switch anywhere from 1,200 to 3,000 times per day. It's all that alt tabbing back and forth, moving from one application to another. Technology was supposed to improve our lives. And so what's the downstream effect of all that? Well, if I'm missing my important communications, if I'm missing context and communications, 
Well, that's gonna lead to lower strategic alignment as an organization as a whole, because I'm surviving through my day. It's gonna lead to lower trust in terms of our relationship between the business and IT, and certainly lower engagement as we fight through that day. If I'm wasting my time context switching, if there's too many steps within workflows and apps to go through, if we're delaying approvals, it's gonna decrease productivity, it's gonna to continue to erode an already decreasing attention span, both at the workplace and at home. It's gonna to begin to slow down decision making. As well, if folks are overwhelmed with the tasks, options that they have, if they're having difficulty to find information, that's gonna to lead to increased stress, lower, ENPS scores, and certainly reduce motivation. So what's one of the answers to all this? Well, at WorkRid, we believe that there's a better way of working that really starts with the employee. See, it begins at looking at their intent and the users of what they need and what they want to do. So if frictioning is happening at the chaos at the back end of their applications within their tech suite, we need a way to cut through that clutter by connecting their intent to utility-rich outcomes. These are happening from everyday business and applications, but bringing that to where they happen to be. This helps to optimize their experience and create lessen the context switch that they're having by guiding their attention to the right information at the right time. This could be items such as time off, pay, IT alerts, smart notifications, procurement requests, and the like. And that begins to prioritize wherever they happen to work. That's a key bit here I don't want to miss, so what a conversational AI assistant is. You can think of it as a co-pilot to your workday within the enterprise. But a true conversational AI assistant is not another place to go, but is with you every step of the way. So imagine, wherever you happen to be, whether that's on the intranet, within Teams, et cetera, your co-pilot is effectively there with you, bringing the right information when and where you need it, contextualized to you, and always there to take your questions and your queries. What I like to do is really highlight some conversational AI use cases from our customers, across our customer base, so you can start to see how these are being used today within action, how they're beginning to dampen digital friction. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use um, these two avatars here as part of the storytelling. Our two friends, Doug and Berkeley. Doug, he's a new AE in our organization, new hire. He's looking to hit the ground running. And as manager Berkeley, well, we're going to be able to showcase some of that functionality that happens between relationships and the conversational AI assistant so you can begin to see how the connections come together. So let's say it's 9 a.m., Doug starts his day, now he could be on his mobile device, he could be on the internet, Teams, doesn't matter. But he can quickly get a full understanding of his day via a daily briefing. This is delivering smart to knows, to do's, from back end systems, wherever he happens to be. So a way to highlight those action items, it's not a replacement for email, it's the smart intelligent nudges that he would have had to hunt, find, or context switch around. It also allows him the ability to quickly converse with the digital assistant as well. He's new, he's going to have questions. Onboarding is certainly a classic use case that we've seen come up. Um, let's face it, what does a typical onboarding process look like? It's usually a mess. There's emails fluttering and flying around, there's checklists that are there for us, but oftentimes we end up like a deer in headlights. It's one of the reasons why our badges always have that awful first day picture of us shocked on that first day because of so much information that we're getting. Here, Doug's able to see quick items that are happening to him and as well, nudging him on what he could ask his AI assistant to provide him with additional context if he happens to have those questions. A buddy, if you will. Another use case that we see um, here, Doug, even his first week, he most likely has to procure a number of items. Perhaps that's something for his desk, a mouse, home supplies. Does Doug care that we use SAP Ariba for procurement? No, he's just trying to get on with his day. He's trying to secure a mouse. So with that, Doug's able to chat to his AI assistant, quickly toggle through, and order the things which are contextualized and permissioned for him. 
He can move throughout today, and this connects back into the system of record. Pardon me. The benefit here is that Doug hasn't, doesn't have to learn another UI. Think about that. All the little UIs that you have to learn, this is bringing that utility driven back up to him. On the flip side, now that he's put in this request for a mouse, what does his manager see? Well, his manager sees that Doug has requested Logitech mouse. Here's a summary of this event. Um, and she can, of course, add in comments that will then be booked into the back end of record within Ariba. She could converse to her AI assistant, um, and she could approve, reject, and so on. Now, this is a classic use case, in fact, that uh, was leveraged by one of our longest standing enterprise uh, customers to showcase really the expedition of approvals and notifications across a flurry of use cases. That can be for employee expenses, procurement requests like we see here, timesheets, but minimizing that from what would typically be potentially weeks down to hours because Berkeley and every other manager would be able to see, receive those smart notifications when and where she is at the right time. Another classic use case here is the ability to chat into databases, sheets, and whatnot. Berkeley, she probably lives within her CRM, but if she's moving throughout her day, perhaps she wants to chat into um, her, her CRM, perhaps the open opportunities that are presented to her. This also has cross-functional capabilities as well. Sales can chat to the assistant for assets, information in relation to marketing, collateral, SKUs, product sheets, et cetera. Um, marketing can do the same in terms of what their rights are based upon the back-end systems. Now, this is a little bit of a, a movie happening in terms of self-service and discovery. So naturally, a classic use case into finding information. It's a little bit of an eye chart, so we have the slides. But Doug's asking um, if he can effectively have his insurance pay for a specific eye test. It knows who Doug is, knows the enterprise systems and the knowledge bases where this lives. It's providing him a snapshot and summary of said policy. This is within our team's uh, UI as well. Him having that conversation, not necessarily on the internet, but embedded in Teams. This could happen in another channel as well. That's the conversation side. This can also be more formalized within FAQs as well, so that Doug, if it's not necessarily asking questions, he can begin to filter down and go through a structured content bit of data. Now, knowledge doesn't necessarily just live within our binaries, it lives within people. Since our buddy Doug is new, he's walking the hallways, and he meets someone by the name of, I think her name was Brooke Brentley, what was it again? Who is Brooke S? The AI assistant understands who he was looking for based upon the org as a whole. Oh, you're looking for Brooklyn Summers. Here's a quick check of who she is, and here he can begin to engage. It's part of that knowledge sensing and story that we hear time and again from our customers. We can't find anything. There's too many places to go. We need to be able to have a laser pinpoint on the areas that we know are rich with information. Now, let's say Doug, he's unable to find his answer by chatting through it to his AI assistant. Um, maybe he's having issues logging into Salesforce. Naturally, he chats into his AI assistant the issue that he's having, and it actually pops up an IT help and support app already pre-filled with the context that he provided based upon the nature of his question. Doug can go through, he can begin to edit the ticket as a whole, he can set category, time, but now it's also going to follow him as a part of the AI assistant story. He'll receive smart status updates in relation to the handling of the ticket. As it moves through its life cycle, he'll get that update. He's not having to go back into another system of record, the ITSM, he's able to get those nudges in time. That begins to compress naturally the time in which Doug's aware, uh, and as well, he's already chatted back to the system that created a number of ticket deflections. Okay, Gen AI is all the rage. Um, and naturally, our engineers, they've been working in conversational AI for quite some time. 
Um, and naturally, two use cases emerge that I'm sure you're very much familiar with. Here, Doug is able to generate some insights on some content where he's wrapped, we've wrapped this within what we effectively and lovingly call a genie. He's able to provide that context within Rails. He's also able to ask it, what's he looking for? Summary, key points, and as well, see the extraction of that. What does this do? Well, it ensures that all of that content, those utterances, they're secure and also further redacted within the guidelines of your appropriate use of AI within your company. We hear that often. Look, my employees, they really want to use Gen AI. They want to use these tools, but we just don't simply want to open up ChatGPT to the world. It's a very controlled manner in which those use cases can be provisioned based upon who, where, we want to connect those two. So highly governed, highly controlled. What does this do? Well, it helps to dampen naturally shadow IT of folks emailing themselves content and then running GPT or another model on their phone with your IP. Now let's say we're a bit more open of an organization. This is something we're beginning to test out um, with our customers. And here, we're not going to necessarily open up um, models, we're going to define it based upon those personas and actions. So Doug, he's a bit junior, uh, and he asks the AI assistant, he was talking to a prospect, they mentioned six, stigma, something, something, I, I have no idea what that is. It's providing with that response of, look, Six Sigma Black Belt is a highly skilled professional, X, Y, and Z. It's also telling him what model is being used. Why is this powerful? Well. We want to be able to optimize the cost of models and conversation based upon the personas who are using said models, as well as the use cases that they can use. Perhaps we give Doug the ability to create content and insights. We don't want him necessarily to be optimizing code. That's a use case we're going to use for our developers, and we're going to provide them with, let's say, Anthropics Opus. Or we want to do the same for our ELT team, but everyone else, they're going to be using chat GPT-3. This allows you to begin to define the LLMs that you bring, the services that you have, and directly tie those to use cases, to personas, and your use of the tool. So how do you get started with conversational AI? Um, what I'd like to do is kind of give you a sense of really how some of our customers have sensed friction throughout their organization to begin to map use cases to where they can get started. So one way that our customers have done this is they've begun to look at well, what are the qualitative areas where friction is going to come up. It's going to happen within employee journeys, such as onboarding. It may happen within line of business functions, like sales, for sales enablement, access, resources, FAQs. Um, it may happen as part of knowledge discovery. It can also be a part of quantitative metrics in terms of ticketing, in terms of wait times, handling times, expense approval times, and so on. All of that has a cost in value. There are some of our customers who've also taken a deeper approach to really perform studies of watching users, seeing where they go, watching the context, which is really witnessing the friction. I'll give you an example of this, of how this can begin to map to use cases. So one way to perform this activity is really understand that friction is going to happen within a few scales. It's going to happen hourly, daily, weekly, et cetera. It may happen only once a year. It's also going to have a degree of pain or even cost related to that, quantitative and qualitative. A good example of this is onboarding. Onboarding is usually a fairly painful process, but it only happens within that first 90-day window. So to that, the blast radius as well, though, is quite large. It's everyone within the organization. So perhaps that's something we want to look at and we wish to assess. Scheduling, well, scheduling is fairly easy. Everyone knows how to use the calendar. Um, happens daily, but it's less in terms of pain. Begin to map out the use cases based upon your unique organization and the data sources that you have and can begin to identify, well, which ones might be the first start of our AI deployment for our assistant. Perhaps it's help and support and knowledge bases. 
providing the questions, the ticket deflection, as well as the ability to input tickets. Or perhaps it's the ability to develop low-code, no-code applications within an AI assistant experience, or maybe it's classic time management and approvals. What occurs is then being able to map out those use cases. And this is a bit of an eye chart here. There's a few other columns that's not uh, served here because you probably need a, a 2010 eyesight. Um, but naturally, you'd want to align to what are the data sources in relation to those use cases, who are going to be the owners for those use cases, and where is our risk appetite for deploying said use cases. Now, in terms of the technology side of the equation, there has to be a good understanding that the AI assistant um, is going to be able to map across your strategy, your culture, and tie into the technology that you wish to deploy, as well as your data sources. What I'd like to do is actually touch upon what to look for in a conversational AI assistant. What are some of the qualities that will be readily apparent so that it's not a pro code exercise. It's not the classic chatbot experience that I'm sure you've heard before, which takes months, years to actually stand up anything viable. So the first conversational AI assistant has to be ubiquitous. It has to be where the employee is. And it has to understand who they are. That's a key differentiator. It's not another place to go. It's not creating added friction within the workplace. The best sidekicks, of course, they're ever present, right? Batman had Alfred, Iron Man had Jarvis. The employees have their co-pilot as a part of their day. The other bit here is it's also providing proactive notifications and nudges to them. So it's not reactive, solely reactive, to take in questions and perform actions. It's able to deliver value to them to showcase and reduce that friction. Another key component to an AI work assistant is it has to have the ability to deeply understand the user. Now, NLP, NLU capabilities, legacy technologies, but what's changed, of course, um, over the last few years is that ability to really optimize the intent to connections into various LLMs as well as RAG processing that optimizes the intent and understanding of the questions and queries as they're entering the assistant. The classic approach was naturally deep level dialogue management. I have key words that I'm mapping down into processes. And what does that do? That naturally reduces the number of use cases you can deploy and bots become effectively a single bot. Um, here, there's the ability to really understand the user, their outcome. Berkeley, she's asking for PTO. It understands it's Berkeley. She's looking for her PTO. And then it's delivering the optimized, perhaps from a back-end app, perhaps a summary based upon the question that she's delivering, but across the knowledge change within the assistant. And in this case, it would actually pop up a benefits app showcasing her current PTO and cash. Another bit that we believe it has to be part of any AI assistant um, is the ability to quickly develop those experiences that quell the friction rapidly. So what would take commonly months to deliver down to effectively hours. And there's many AI assistants out there within the marketplace, many are chatbots under the cover. It has to have the ability to have a low-code, no-code application. It's really the heartbeat and center of the product so that those experiences can quickly be organized and orchestrated for the employee. Perhaps it's the PTO card, perhaps it's time off. Uh, in fact, one of our customers was able to develop these eight to 10 times faster as they did a pace car between the two, pro code development and using the no code builder. Another bit that has to be readily um, available and accessible is having templates and data sources. So the ability to have, let's say, procurement approvals quickly and readily stood up. This one here is connected to ServiceNow. There may be another app or data source um, that's available to um, this organization's um, tech stack. But here, it allows them to start from a basis, bring their keys, and get started right away. Or 
augment and change based upon their unique use cases in terms of how this should be set up. As well, outside of templates, the way to quickly stand up that recipe has to have the ability to have those data sources available, the APIs that you can quickly connect or create even novel new use cases that meet your organizational needs. Now, last folks, in closing, um, the world's changed, but people certainly have not. And if we can take a step to really understand the digital friction within their day, understand how the world looks like to them, well, maybe we can deliver the digital workplaces experiences that we all want, human-centric, engaged, and now conversational. Thank you so much for your time. Um, if you haven't seen WorkGrid as a product, as a demo, please join us down the, uh, the exposition floor. Um, and if you also have uh, some questions on who's fact-checking me today, our founder and CTO, Jillian McCann, um, our AI expert, can also take questions as we have a few minutes down the end here. Thank you so much.